Take God's word, if you will, and look with me to the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. We will pick up right where we left off last Sunday. I want to talk to you around the subject matter of why the death of Christ. Why the death of Christ? I'm not going to give a big, long introduction today. I'll just say to you that uh, this is one of those difficult passages in the book of Hebrews. And fact of the matter is we could probably spend years uh, right here in this single little passage and um, never, ever deal with everything that is contained in it. But I do believe that there are some life-transforming truths that we can mine out of here that can change us. As a matter of fact, several came uh, in this last service and talking about how this particular passage ministered to them and blessed them and lifted them uh, where they are. Remember, I told you that uh, the book of Hebrews really is a good, strong book of encouragement. And uh, if there are anybody here this morning that is in need of encouragement, uh, hang on, I believe you'll get it before you leave today. Let me share with you the first life-transforming moment and truth that's here. And, and, and it's really simple, a sad situation. A sad situation. Pick it up where we left off. Verse 5, if you will. For unto the angels he, uh, uh, for he, let me back up. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now, it goes back to chapter number 1. And uh, God plainly tells us in chapter 1 that the Lord Jesus is much greater than the angels. And he's really speaking here this morning uh, about that time when man was created by God, put in the garden, that everything that was created was subject and under the dominion of man. But this passage here is saying with us that it was God's intention that in that beginning that man be above everything, superior to everything. But he certainly says in chapter 1 that Jesus is better than the angels. And one of these days, uh, guys, according to the word of God, we're going to judge angels. Uh, that, that's a fact according to Scripture. And, and he's talking about that time and that millennial reign of Christ. But here, uh, he uses a little word in, in verse 6. Go on and pick it up. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? You, you ought to kind of highlight that word a little bit. It really means, do you really care? It's the word care here. Uh, it's it's mind-boggling to me to think that God cares for us even in the fallen state that we are in. E even on this side of Adam and Eve's uh, disobedience. I suspect that there have been a lot of people that showed up here this morning that having the question mark in their mind, uh, does anybody care for me? Any, anybody here feel that way? Does anybody care about who I am. A lot of lonely people showed up today wondering, does anybody care? Many of that are ill wondering, does anybody care? Those that have come today broken and battered and bruised, wondering, does anybody care? Those come today that are discouraged and despondent and maybe even despair that are wondering, does anybody care? Well, the word of God's real clear. God cares about you. God cares. Whether anybody else cares or not, God does. And he says in the word, cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Look at the beginning part of verse number eight. Um, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now... We see not yet all things put under him. Now when I read these verses this morning, I, I, I get this amazing question. I wonder what it was like to have lived 
before the fall. Have you ever thought about what life was like on the earth before Adam and Eve really ate that forbidden fruit? I can tell you this, brother, you and I wouldn't be bald today. Huh? Amen? We'd have hair. Hey, guys, y'all wouldn't have to get up and go to work tomorrow. And ladies, uh, there would be no pain in childbirth. Run with that a little bit. I wonder how many kids would be running around the house today if there were no pain in childbirth. Mm. I just think about what, what, it, what would it be like to have lived before the fall? And, and I, I get really dwelling on that sometimes and then all I got to do is just go look in the mirror and all of a sudden, boom, reality has set back in. I, I did a little research and getting here today is, is I wanted to know, okay, what's the value? What is man that thou art mindful of him? And I thought about the human body and I wondered uh, how much is the human body actually worth? And, and if you get, do the research and do the math, you, you figure out, well, we're made up of this chemical and that chemical and this particular chemical and that. And if you isolated every one of the chemicals that make up our body and you put a value on each of those chemicals and were to sell it, you couldn't get $5 for it. Now, I've looked at some of you. You, you couldn't get anywhere near that. But anyway, <laughs> less than $5. But yet, you know what we do? We spend $8,000 in putting a dead body in the ground that's not worth $5. But what is man that thou art mindful of him? There are a lot of people that feel like that uh, we're only using about 10% of the potential of the human brain. Well, we didn't need to spend millions of dollars trying to research that. All you got to do is just go drive 74 for a little bit and you'll discover real quick can, can you imagine what we would have done? Can you imagine the thought processes? It, it, it's really mind-boggling to think about it, what we could have become had there been no disobedience, had there been no fall, had there not been a rebellion in that garden. That is the point that he is making here in this passage. Again in verse 8, you put all things in subjection under him, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We, we would have had dominion over the stars, over the wind, o over the plant life. We would have had dominion over the animal kingdom. It, 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 it's fascinating. The whole thing we would have had dominion over. I, I don't know how many Sundays, it, I don't understand this. I don't know how many Sundays that we have had since Labor Day that we've had bad weather on Sunday mornings. If before the fall, all we'd have had to say was, before the fall we could have said, I want 72 degree weather and sunny and bright every Sunday morning and boom, it would have been there. <laughs> I've said it. But now we see not yet all things put under him. How true this is. We can't control the weather. We, we can't control the flight of a bird. Matter of fact, we can't even do anything about ourselves. Why? Because we're part of this fallen humanity. Verse 9. But we see Jesus. That's shouting ground right there. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Which brings me to the second point. There is a miraculous restoration. Not only a sad situation, but a miraculous restoration. After looking at the contrast in the previous verses, at what we could have become and what reality now is, it is so discouraging and so depressing. But now the writer says, get refocused and get your eyes on Jesus. But we see Jesus. And when you get your eyes on him, 
then it'll deal with your discouragement. It will deal with your despair. It will deal with your loneliness and every other thing that you're facing today. I, I was speaking to a young lady yesterday who was cutting my hair for the very first time and I asked her about his relationship with God. I asked her about her relationship with the church. She really didn't want to talk about it at all. And I said, what happened to you? Well, why do you feel this way? And she said, well, I'll just tell you. And she went on to tell me a sordid story about what happened in her last church and uh, the financial uh, stuff that went on. And she got so discouraged. I said, hang on a minute. You're always going to get discouraged when you see other people and you're focused in on people but stay focused in on Jesus and he will never disappoint you. He will never discourage you. Who, who is this Jesus? We see Jesus. Who is that? He never wrote a book. He never traveled very far from home. Barely lived to be 33 years old. Who is this Jesus? Well, I'm going to tell you who he is. He's the one who calms the storms. He's the one who brings peace out of chaos. He's the one that speaks to the waves. He's the one that speaks to the wind and they lay down. He's the one who commands the molecules of the water to join hands together and makes a highway for him to be able to walk upon. He speaks to the disciples and says to them, go down to the lake down there and I want you to catch a fish and in the mouth of that fish is a coin. Take that coin and go pay it to the government for our taxes. There's not a fish big enough to hold the money I owe for taxes every year. You know what I'm saying? He's the one who spoke to demons that they had to flee. He's the one that brought life out of death. He's the one that healed the sick and he caused the lame man not just to walk but to leap and run and praise God. And he brought hope out of those that were in despair. We see Jesus. Now, the Bible says he was a little lower. He's talking about his humanity at this point made a little lower than the angels. Boy, that just ties in directly to what the Word of God says in Philippians. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and then being found in fashion as a man. What did he say? He humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. What a tremendous picture this is of the humanity of Christ. Again now in verse 9, the Bible says, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death. Now that doesn't mean that he just got a little bit of inkling on his tongue enough to taste. That word taste means that he fully embraced it. He engulfed it. He completely dealt with it and consumed it upon himself who tasted death. Powerful words that are here. And, and, and the fact is you and I could live to be a 400 years old and we could never ever plumb the depths of what this verse really is speaking of. But the word says that he became sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God through Christ. That's incredible. That's an incredible statement that he bore the sins of all of mankind for all of time there on that cross. May I say to you that when he hung there on the cross and he cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? May I tell you, it was not from the pains that came from the nails in his hands nor in his feet. It was not from the pain of the crown of thorns that was plunged down on his head. When he became sin, ladies and gentlemen, he took upon him the pain of all of the sins of all of mankind for all of eternity. That's why he cried out to God. Now notice what he says, for everyone. He paid the sin debt for everyone. Uh, I want you to hear me and hear me well 
in a spiritual, I don't want to use the word spiritual, in a religious culture in America today, this is needed for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I struggle to get a full comprehension of the doctrine of election and the free will of man. But here's where I have come to believe that if you want to be saved, glory to God, you can be saved because the gospel is for everybody. I've talked to a number of people uh, as a Christian and witnessed to a number of people about their relationship to God. And I've heard them say back to me time and again, well, pastor, I do believe what you're telling me, but you don't understand what I have done. You don't understand the depth of my sin. You don't understand the far reaching of my life. I've been there and I've done everything that you can imagine and I just cannot imagine and can't think that God could ever forgive me for everything. I said, well, dude, what have you done? And he goes on to tell me you've done this, done that, done that. And when he gets through with that long list of laundry, I come to the conclusion, you're probably right. God can't probably forgive you for that. <laughs> no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed there on Calvary, it's adequate enough to take care of the past of everybody. Everybody. Let me give you number three, a glorious salvation. A glorious salvation. Look at verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now this is very, very important verse. Why? Because he's talking here about the object of his death, uh, bringing many sons to glory. I, I can't wait. One of these days I'm going to be on that trip from here to there. And on the way, I'm going to realize more than ever before that it was the death of Christ that enabled me to get from here to there. Notice the little phrase, it became him. It was fitting. Uh, it was appropriate for him. Notice the little word perfect that is in there. May, may I say to you that Jesus Christ was perfect in his character, but he was yet to be perfect in what he came to do. He, not perfect in his function. His function yet was not perfect. It, the word perfect there is the word teleos, and it means to be complete. And understand, Jesus was perfect and complete in everything except his function, and that function was completed when he died on the cross. Think with me a minute. You're going to go to, if you haven't already been to Life Group, you'll go to Life Group in a little bit. You're going to get in your car. You're going to crank it up. You're going to head down the street. You're going to go through some winding roads, pull into your neighborhood, into the driveway, into the garage, shut the motor off, and your journey will be complete. Your journey will be perfect. In the context of this scripture, understand that Jesus is adequate. Jesus is complete. Jesus is total through the death on the cross. Look at verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, Hang with me for a minute because I'm getting ready to make a dramatic statement that many of you have never heard before. If you've been here a while, you've heard me say it, but here it is. Understand, when we were saved, when we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we were born again, immediately we were kinfolk with each other and with Jesus. Now this deals specifically with the fallacy of universal salvation. 
That, that's a growing trend in our culture. Oh, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all going to go to heaven one of these days. We're all part of the family of God. No, that's not true. That's not scriptural. You understand it is only through faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, that we are brothers and sisters. He is the only way that we will ever get to heaven. And the day that you got saved, you became part of the family of God. We are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, verse 11, one more time. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Hear my heart a minute. The day you get saved is the day that Jesus makes you as holy as he is holy. You're as holy as Jesus. You're as righteous as God. When God transformed you by his grace, he no longer looks at you. He looks at you through the blood of Jesus. And when he sees you through the blood of Jesus, you are as positionally holy as he is holy. Not practically holy, certainly not in practice, but positionally you are as holy as he is holy. You say, preacher, that sure is a bold statement. Aren't you being a little bit presumptuous? No, I'm just grateful to God that he no longer sees me apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, watch verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. He's talking about here being a part of God's forever family. When born again by the Spirit of God, you become part of the family of God with Jesus as your elder brother. Now, watch this in verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that's the incarnation of Christ, word became flesh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You say, now wait just a minute. Stop right there, preacher. Now I, 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 need, to, I, need, to get, I need to deal with this. If God destroyed the devil through the death of Christ, who's chasing me? Who tempted me to eat that bread pudding last night? Who is it that constantly is bombarding me with his spirit of lust? Who is it that is, is following and chasing after me? If the devil is, dis, is destroyed, then why am I being so tempted to sin? Who's doing that? The devil. You say, you're not making much sense. Well, I hope to. You understand that God, through the death of Christ, didn't put the devil out of existence. He just put him out of commission. And then when he put him out of commission, the devil lost his ability to kill you with his stinger. Now the Bible says that Satan came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But through Jesus' death on the cross, God broke through in the middle of Satan's ability to cut you off and alienate you from God forever. I have a buddy of mine, preacher buddy of mine. When he was a little boy, uh, he and his brother and some of his buddies, they would catch a lot of bees. And they'd get those bees and they'd do surgery on the bees. And they would take the stinger uh, out of the bees, put them in a jar, and he says that he would take them to his sister's room and let all those bees out in her room and scare her to death. 
Now, his mom and daddy put the fear of God back in him, but he's scared <laughs> her to death. Now, she didn't realize that those bees couldn't hurt her. They could only scare her. May I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the devil can't sting you. The only thing that he can do is scare you and make it appear that you're going to go to the judgment, make you feel like that you're under the wrath of God and damnation. But all of that, ladies and gentlemen, was taken care of on the cross of Jesus when his stinger was removed and drowned in the blood of Christ. Amen. Now, watch verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. Jesus is the only one who can set you free. If you're an alcoholic, a drug addict, you have strongholds in your life that you can't deal with, I promise you the culture that we're living in doesn't have the answer. You can read all of the psychosomatic garbage that you want to read and you can go to every, every therapist in the world to try to help you, but I'm just gonna share something. Only Jesus can set you free. Amen. Only Jesus can deliver you. Only Jesus can tear down those bondages and strongholds out of your life. Let me give you number four as I conclude. It's a needed identification. A needed identification. You understand that Jesus identifies with you and me through his humanity and his incarnation. Watch in verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. Thank God. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on humanity. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. I am grateful that when God decided that he was going to redeem mankind out of uh, sin, he didn't do it from a distance. He chose to wrap himself up in humanity and draw near uh, unto us and live among us. And for 33 years he lived among us, but yet he was still God so that he might identify with us. Salvation is by identification. Say that out loud. Salvation is by identification. One more time. Salvation is by identification. So here he is. He leaves heaven, becomes a man, fully God, fully man. He felt hunger. He felt tired. He felt lonely. He felt discouragement. He felt it all. So did he get identified with your needs? And, and the Bible uses this term high priest, that he became our high priest. Now, we're not going to dig too deep into that right now because it appears over and over and over again uh, throughout now until the ninth chapter. But you, you, there, there are a lot of priests, but there's only one high priest. And, and the high priest would go into the holy of holies and he would offer up a sacrifice for the sins of the nation of Israel. What was the purpose? to deal with their sin before God. Not like the way that our sins are dealt with. Those sins would have to be dealt with again next year. So he would only roll forward the sins of the nation for one year. But our sins through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ are covered, never to be brought up against us ever again. So he is our high priest. Now notice the term mercy, which is directed toward us, and faithfulness, which is directed to God. Now again, verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now what does that mean? Reconciliation for the sins of people. You know this to be true that the wages of sin is 
death. The, the Bible says that the soul that sins shall surely die. So the consequence of sin is death. Jesus laid his life down on that cross that satisfied the just demands of God for the penalty for your sins and my sins and for the sins of all humanity. He bore it on Calvary. He paid the supreme death that you owed and that I owed. Verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Some of you right now, in this church are going through some of the most horrible times that you've ever gone through in your life. You feel like somebody has run you through a meat grinder. Some of you are here this morning, you feel absolutely just completely shredded. You have nothing left to give, almost to the point of hopelessness. Some of you are here this morning, you're facing temptations and trials and difficulties and exigencies in this life that you never dreamed that you would ever face and you're wondering how in the world am I ever going to be able to get through this? And when you cry out, you say, wait a minute, wait, preacher, cry. God doesn't understand what I'm going through. Nobody understands what I am facing. Nobody's had to deal with what I am dealing with right now. Oh, but that's where you're wrong. The Bible says that he's been touched with every feeling of our infirmities. The Bible says that he's gone through everything that you and I will ever encounter or face in this life, which enables him to completely understand and identify with what you need. And he's able to give you what you need. There's nothing that you're going through that he hasn't already been there. And he cares about you. He cares about your broken marriage. He cares about the fact that after all of these years of giving your best to some employer, he lets you go. He cares about the fact that you just got back from the doctor and the doctor said there's nothing else he can do. He cares about the fact that your children have gone astray and in rebellion. He cares about the fact that you feel like that there's nobody in the world that understands you. He cares that you're lonely. He cares that you're discouraged. He not only has the supply to your need, he is the supply to your need. And my call for you today is to come to Christ. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.